The first reading is on page 740 uh, of the Church Bible and is Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 to 4. That's page 740 of the Church Bible. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. The second reading is from Luke chapter 4 on page 1061, reading from verse 1 to verse 8, Luke 24, 10, page 1061. The Resurrection. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. Can I add my words of welcome to those of Aaron earlier in the service? Um, for those of you I haven't yet met, my name is Jo. I'm one of the clergy licensed here at St. Nick's, um, and I also happen to be married to the vicar. <laughs> Before I begin, shall we bow our heads in prayer? May I speak to the glory of God the Father, and in the name of Jesus the Son, and through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, does anybody here listen to Radio 4? Oh, yes, I've got, I've got a few hands gone up. Um, well, I sometimes get a small window of opportunity to listen to Radio 4. Um, usually it's on car journeys, um, and it's just before my daughter has realized that it is Radio 4, because the moment she does realize, an arm comes across, and a, a switch gets flicked, and suddenly we're into Heart FM. I don't know if any of you have a similar experience. Um, well, anyway, in that small window of opportunity, I sometimes get to hear a program called The Long View. Does anyone, anyone have come across The Long View? A few, a few people have. Um, the Long View is a program in which aspects of life today are compared with historical situations. Uh, so, for example, one program compared the debate about the safety of driverless cars today um, with the safety about the debate about the new railways back in the 1830s. And another program compared the reaction of black cab drivers in London to Uber taxis taking away their business today with the reaction of um, London's Thames watermen 
back in the 1750s when they were building new bridges across the Thames. Um, because, of course, uh, the new bridges were taking the business away from the watermen who used to ferry people across the river. Anyway, on its website, the Long View describes itself as a program in which stories from the past shed light on current events. And that's what I'd like to explore today. Today I'd like to explore how stories from the past shed light on current events. Because today is Remembrance Sunday. And it's the day each year when we remember the courage and the suffering of those involved in the wars of the 20th and 21st centuries. And it's especially significant this year because it marks a hundred years since the end of the First World War, the war which gave rise to this tradition of remembrance. And the act of remembrance means that we do not forget the pain and the bravery of those who had to face those wars. But Remembrance Sunday offers something else as well. It offers us an opportunity for the stories of those who lived and died in wartime to shed light onto our current experience. So today, on Remembrance Sunday, we are going to take the long view. We're going to look at some of those stories from the past so that they can shed light onto our present. And I'd like to look at the stories of three people in particular today. Um, and I don't know if we could possibly have uh, the first slide there. Thank you. The first person today is Fred Lloyd. Now, my knowledge of Fred comes from a published interview he gave in 2004. He starts the interview like this. I was born on the 23rd of February, 1898, at Copwood in Uckfield. 106 years later, I'm still in the same town. I like it here. I think there's a bit of understatement going on there. Fred was one of 16 children and both his parents died when he was young. He left school at 13 and started work as a gardener in a large country estate. He recalls a day when one of the coachmen who worked on the same estate came out into the garden and said, the Titanic sunk, Fred. I said, Titanic? What's the Titanic? When the First World War started, Fred was too young to join up, but in 1916, at the age of 18, he was accepted into the Royal Field Artillery. During training, however, there was an outbreak of meningitis, and Fred was one of only two to survive. He was deemed unfit for the trenches, but still sent to France as part of the veterinary corps to look after horses. And reading Fred's interview is moving in many ways. He's honest, but he doesn't take himself too seriously. He describes the day-to-day -day realities of wartime in France. He says, I remember what we had to eat during the war. For breakfast, bully beef. Lunch was bully beef. And for dinner, anyone like to hazard a guess? Bully beef. He carries on. It came in those big tins, and in hot weather, you'd be able to pour it out. That doesn't sound great, does it? The idea of pouring beef out of a tin. But most moving, is about, is, is what Fred says at the end of his interview. He says this, even after all the horrors of war, I've retained my faith. Do I believe in God? Yes, I do. He carries on a little bit later. 
I prayed during the war. I prayed when I was going to France and we were being followed by a submarine. And in France, I prayed when I was frightened. I used to get very frightened. I expect I shouldn't have done and I should have been braver. Sometimes I felt a bit of a coward, but I did my best. I find Fred's story both touching and remarkable. It's touching because here is someone who's faced the death of his parents, his older brother in the trenches, almost died himself of meningitis, and he's taking daily risks in France. Yet he still thinks he should have been braver. And his story is remarkable because of its testimony to God and the faith that he still has despite everything he's seen. His story is time and again marked by hopefulness, not wishful thinking or a kind of forced cheerfulness. This is hopefulness grounded in faith. And this brings me on to our New Testament reading for this morning. Because Fred's hopefulness, the hopefulness of the Christian faith, is grounded in the events Luke describes. Jesus has died. Darkness came over the land. The sun stopped shining and Jesus took his last breath. His body has been taken down from the cross, wrapped in a shroud and buried. It is the end. And then our reading starts. And perhaps we could have it on the screen. Our reading starts on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. The women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Luke is telling us that this is not the end. This is the beginning. The beginning of the week, the beginning of the day, the beginning of Jesus' risen life. And the women, understandably enough, are afraid. They can't find Jesus' body and instead are greeted by two angelic messengers. These messengers say to them, remember, remember that Jesus told you that death would not be the end for him, that he would be raised from death. And then in verse eight, the women did remember. They remembered Jesus' words. There's a lot of remembering going on here. At a time of great fear, the women at the tomb remembered Jesus' words. At times of great fear during the war, Fred Lloyd remembered his faith in God. And for us here today, taking the long view, Remembering means letting their experiences enlighten ours. For all of us, there are times of great fear. There will be times when we feel pushed to the limits of what we can endure. And it is at those times that we may hear again the words of those two angelic messengers pointing to Jesus' resurrection and the future hope that it brings. He is not here. He is risen. And that gives us grounds for hopefulness. Death is not the end. Death does not have the last word. Beyond the greatest of ends, there is a new beginning. But there's a risk in what I've just said. And the risk is 
that it may make faith sound easy. Faith in the midst of trauma is not easy. Fred Lloyd's words testify that faith is not easy. The horrors of war challenged it in many ways. And that brings me on to our second person today, James Hope. Now, I know about James from his son, David Hope. David and Catherine Hope are members of our congregation here at St. Nick's. Many of you may know them. Um, They sadly can't be here this morning. Um, But David let me see the letters that his father, James, wrote to his own mother during the First World War. And the first letter he wrote begins like this. I... On the 6th of May 1918, was given a command by Sergeant Allen to take a rifle and bayonet, which I disobeyed, knowing it is better to obey God rather than man. James' faith in God prevented him from taking up a weapon. He was imprisoned as a conscientious objector and then court-martialed. His objections were upheld and he was sentenced to do civil work, a kind of enforced labor for the rest of the war and even for two years beyond the end of the war. There's nothing easy about the choice that James made. At the time of the First World War, conscientious objectors were widely condemned and insulted and it took real bravery to stand against the overwhelming public opinion at that time. Fred Lloyd and James Hope both show that faith in God does not necessarily give easy answers. One chose to fight, the other chose not to fight. They each interpreted their situation differently. And yet, They shared the same grounds for hope. As James wrote to his mother, the world may try its best by putting us in prison, but they can never separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so to our third person this morning. Our third person is an army chaplain probably the most famous army chaplain of the First World War, Geoffrey Studdard Kennedy. He was also known as Woodbine Willie. I don't know if any of you have heard the name Woodbine Willie, a few, a few have. He was named that because he handed out both New Testaments and Woodbine cigarettes to the soldiers he served with. In 1916, Studdard Kennedy was ordered to the front line just before the Battle of the Somme. When the battle had been going for a day, Kennedy was asked to go out into no man's land to see if he could cheer up the troops who were digging new trenches there. And he wrote this. Fear came. There was pain underneath my belt. Of course, I had to go. It was the parish. The front line became Kennedy's parish. And the horror of what he saw there did not leave him. Later, he tells of conducting a communion service and of giving communion to a corporal with these words. The body of Christ, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. He adds, three days later, I buried his body, terribly mutilated, in a shell hole just behind the line. For Kennedy, it was Jesus' suffering on the cross that shed light onto those events. In Jesus Christ, God suffered with and for his people. Earlier, we heard a prophecy from Isaiah. 
And we heard that prophecy speak about a man of sorrows familiar with suffering. In Christian understanding, this is a prophecy about Jesus Christ, who before he could rise on Easter Day, first suffered the agony of a long drawn out death, nailed to a cross. In Jesus' own suffering, Kennedy found an assurance that when pain and fear are daily realities, Jesus has been there before and in his risen life offers to walk beside us still. We've looked at three stories, three stories from a hundred years ago. They are all stories of bravery and of suffering. They are different from a conscientious objector to a frontline chaplain, but they share a common belief. And it is that common belief, the insight that they shared that has most to say to us here today. Because they, like us, have taken the long view. They let the events of long ago, outside a tomb in Jerusalem, shed light into the darkness of war. And from them, we learn hope, the grounding of Christian hope, that in Jesus' death and resurrection, we, like them, can find God's new beginning. The final words this morning belong to Geoffrey Studdart Kennedy. Kennedy wrote poetry, and in one of his poems, he imagines a girl thinking about the young man she loves who's been killed in the war. This is from Kennedy's collection of poetry with the title, The Unutterable Beauty. And it's a poem called Easter. There was rapture of spring in the morning when we told of our love in the wood. For you were the spring in my heart, dear lad, and I vowed that my life was good. But there's winter of war in the evening and lowering clouds overhead. There's wailing of wind in the chimney nook, and I vow that my life lies dead. For the sun may shine on the meadowlands, and the dog rose bloom in the lanes, but I've only weeds in my garden, lad, wild weeds that are rank with the rains. One solace there is for me, sweet but faint, as it floats on the wind of the years, a whisper that spring is the last true thing, and that triumph is born of tears. It comes from a garden of other days, and an echoing voice that cries, Behold, I am alive forevermore, and in me the dead shall rise. <laughs>